This recording is a product of Audio Anarchy, The Anatomy of Fascism, by Robert O. Paxton. Chapter 6, The Long Term, Radicalization or Entropy. Fascist regimes could not settle down into a comfortable enjoyment of power. The charismatic leader had made dramatic promises to unify, purify, and energize his community, to save it from the flabbiness of bourgeois materialism, the confusion and corruption of democratic politics, and the contamination of alien people and culture. To head off the threatened revolution of property with a revolution of values, to rescue the community from decadence and decline, he had offered sweeping solutions to these menaces, violence against enemies both inside and out, the individual's total immersion in the community, the purification of blood and culture, the galvanizing enterprises of rearmament and expansionist war. He had assured his people a, quote, privileged relation with history, unquote. Fascist regimes had to produce an impression of driving momentum, quote, permanent revolution, unquote, in order to fulfill these promises. They could not survive without that headlong, inebriating rush forward, without an ever-mounting spiral of ever more daring challenges fascist regimes risked decaying into something resembling a tepid authoritarianism. With it, they drove toward a final paroxysm of self-destruction. Fascist or partly fascist regimes do not inevitably succeed in maintaining momentum. Several regimes, sometimes considered fascist, deliberately took the opposite tack of damping down excitement. They normalized themselves and thereby became more authoritarian than fascist. The Spanish dictator, General Francisco Franco, for example, is often considered fascist because of his armed conquest of power in the Spanish Civil War with the overt aid of Mussolini and Hitler. Indeed, helping the Spanish Republicans defend themselves against Franco's rebellion after July 1936 was the first and most emblematic anti-fascist crusade. After his victory in March 1939, Franco unleashed a bloody repression that may have killed as many as 200,000 people and attempted to seal off his regime from both economic exchange and cultural contamination from the democratic world. Virulently hostile to democracy, liberalism, secularism, Marxism, and especially Freemasonry, Franco joined Hitler and Mussolini in April 1939 as a signatory of the anti comintern Pact. During the battle for France in 1940, he seized Tangiers. He seemed eager to expand further at the expense of Britain and France, and to become a, quote, full-scale military partner of the Axis, unquote. Whenever Hitler pressed him to act, however, the cautious Caudillo always set his price for full belligerency on the Axis side unattainably high. A few days after meeting Franco at Hendaye on the French-Spanish border, on October 23, 1940, Hitler told Mussolini that he would rather have three or four teeth pulled than spend another nine hours bargaining with that, quote, Jesuit swine, unquote. After the terrible bloodletting of 1936 through 39, Franco wanted order and quiet. Fascist dynamism fit badly with his reserved temperament. Franco's regime did have a single party, the Falange, but without parallel structures, it lacked autonomous power. Although it grew to nearly a million members during the period of German victories in 1941 through 42, and gave the dictatorship useful support with its ceremonies, the Caudillo allowed it no share in policymaking or administration. 
The elimination of the Falange's charismatic leader, José Antonio Primo de Rivera, at the beginning of the Civil War, as we recall from Chapter 3, helped Franco to establish the preeminence of the established elites and the normative state. Thereafter, he was able to exploit the multiplicity of extreme right parties and the inexperience of José Antonio's successor, Manuel Hedilla, to reduce fascist influence further. He cleverly submerged the Falange within an amorphous umbrella organization that included both fascists and traditional monarchists. The Falange Española Tradicionalista y de las Juntas de Ofensiva Nacional Sindicalista. Its leader was condemned to, quote, impotence as a decorative part of Franco's entourage, unquote. When Hedilla tried to reassert independent authority in April 1937, Franco had him arrested. The domestication of the Falange made it easier for Franco to give his dictatorship the traditional form, with a minimum of fascist excitement. That was clearly his preference, certainly after 1942 and probably before. After 1945, the Falange became a colorless civic solidarity association, normally referred to simply as the Movimiento. In 1970, its very name was abolished. By then, Franquist Spain had long become an authoritarian regime dominated by the army, state officials, businessmen, landowners, and the church, with almost no visible fascist coloration. Portugal, whose malfunctioning parliamentary regime had been overthrown by a military coup in 1926, was governed after the early 1930s by a reclusive economics professor of integrist Catholic views, Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. Dr. Salazar leaned even more than Franco toward cautious quietism. Where Franco subjected Spain's fascist party to his personal control, Salazar abolished outright in July 1934 the nearest thing Portugal had to an authentic fascist movement, Roleo Preto's blue-shirted National Syndicalists. The Portuguese fascists, Salazar complained, were, quote, always feverish, excited, and discontented, shouting, faced with the impossible, more, more, unquote. Salazar preferred to control his population through such organic institutions traditionally powerful in Portugal as the church. When civil war broke out in neighboring Spain in 1936, organic authority was no longer enough. Dr. Salazar experimented with a, quote, new state, unquote, Estado Novo, fortified with devices borrowed from fascism, including corporatist labor organization, a youth movement, Portuguese youth or Mocidade Portuguesa, and a powerless single party clad in blue shirts, the Portuguese Legion. Rejecting fascist expansionism, Portugal remained neutral in World War II and all subsequent conflicts until it decided to fight the Angolan independence movement in 1961. Hoping to spare Portugal the pains of class conflict, Dr. Salazar even opposed the industrial development of his country until the 1960s. His regime was not only non-fascist, but, quote, voluntarily non-totalitarian, unquote, preferring to let those of its citizens who kept out of politics, quote, live by habit, unquote. At the other extreme, Nazi Germany alone experienced full radicalization. A victorious war of extermination in the East offered almost limitless freedom of action to the prerogative state and its parallel institutions, released from the remaining constraints of the normative state such as they were. In a no-man's land composed of conquered territories in what had been Poland and the western parts of the Soviet Union, Nazi party radicals felt free to carry out their ultimate fantasies of racial cleansing. Extreme radicalization remains latent in all fascisms, but the circumstances of war, and particularly of victorious wars of conquest, give it the fullest means of expression. Radicalizing impulses were not absent from Mussolini's Italy. Torn between periodic urges to reinvigorate the aging blackshirts and the normalizing drag of conservative fellow travelers, 
the fascist regime followed an irregular trajectory. Mussolini had popularized the term totalitarianism, and he continued to lace his orations with bombastic appeals to action and promises of revolution. In practice, however, he shifted back and forth, unleashing party radicals on occasion when his power position would benefit, but more often reining them in when his rule needed stable conditions and an unchallenged state. Having been a daring gambler during the seizure of power, Mussolini turned out as prime minister to prefer stability to adventure. The penchant for normalization that had first appeared in 1921 with his proposed pact of pacification with the socialists was to grow with age, through the force of circumstances as well as by personal predilection. As we saw in Chapter 4, he sought during the first two years after taking office in 1922 to curb the party's adventurism and the rival power of the Raz by asserting the primacy of the state. He declined to challenge the extensive powers held by the monarchy, the church, and his conservative partners. Mussolini's economic policy conformed during those early years to the laissez-faire policies of liberal regimes. His first minister of finance, 1922 through 25, was the professor of economics and party activist Alberto de Stefani, who reduced state intervention in the economy cut and simplified taxes, diminished government spending, and balanced the budget. It is true that De Stefani committed not only to free trade but also to the fascist ideal of stimulating productive energy made some businessmen angry by cutting such import duties as the one protecting expensive locally produced beet sugar. In general, however, he displayed, quote, an unmistakable pro-business bias, unquote. Another cycle of radicalization and normalization followed the murder of the socialist leader Giacomo Matteotti. Mussolini's first response to the ensuing firestorm of criticism was further normalization. He gave the crucial Ministry of the Interior, with its supervision over the police, to Luigi Federzoni, head of the Nationalist Party, which had merged with the Fascist Party in 1923. After hunkering down for six months against attacks not only from the Democratic opposition, but from some of his conservative allies, seemingly paralyzed by uncertainty, the Duce was forced by pressure from party radicals, as we saw in Chapter 4, to carry out what amounted to a preemptive coup d'etat on January 3, 1925, and to begin the long process that, by fits and starts, replaced the parliamentary regime with what he called, with some exaggeration, a totalitarian state. His appointment of one of the most intransigent fascist militants, Roberto Farinacci, as secretary of the fascist party, seemed to confirm his intention to let the party set the pace, infiltrate the bureaucracy, and dominate national policymaking. When Mussolini sacked Farinacci a little more than a year later, however, in April 1926, and replaced him with the less headstrong Augusto Turati, 1926-29, through 29, he was again strengthening the normative state at the expense of the party. It was at this point, most significantly, that he entrusted the Italian police to a professional civil servant, Arturo Boccini, rather than to a party zealot on the Himmler model. Operating the all-important police force on bureaucratic principles, promotion of trained professionals by seniority, respect for legal procedures, at least in non-political cases, rather than as a part of a prerogative state of unlimited arbitrary power, was Italian fascism's most important divergence from Nazi practice. In 1928, Mussolini removed the old syndicalist militant Edmondo Rossoni from leadership of the fascist trade unions, putting an end to Rossoni's efforts to give them a real share in economic policy and equal representation alongside management in a single set of corporatist organizations. After Rossoni's departure, the fascist union's monopoly of labor representation was all that remained of, quote, fascist syndicalism, unquote. Labor and management faced each other in separate organizations, and union representatives were banished from the shop floor. 
The form in which Mussolini's much-vaunted corporate state developed henceforth amounted, in effect, to the reinforcement under state authority of employers' private power. Mussolini's most decisive step toward normalization was the 1929 Lateran Pact with the Papacy. Though this treaty had forbidden any Catholic political activity in Italy, its long-term effects were favorable to the Church. Pope Pius XI, no Democrat, had little taste for Catholic political parties anyway, much preferring to nurture schools and Catholic action, the network of youth and worker associations that would transform society from within. Thereafter, despite a bout with fascist zealots who harassed Catholic youth programs in 1931, the Church's grassroots organizations were to outlast fascism and sustain the long post-war rule of the Christian Democratic Party. Mussolini had retreated far toward traditional authoritarian rule, in which the monarchy, organized business, the army, and the Catholic Church possessed large spheres of autonomous responsibility independent of either the fascist party or the Italian state. Mussolini probably preferred to rule that way as he grew older, but he knew the younger generation was impatient with his aging regime. Quote, We were spiritually equipped to be assault squads, unquote, complained the young fascist Indro Montanelli in 1933. Quote, but fate has given us the role of Swiss guards on the constituted order, unquote. That was one reason why, in 1935, he took the classic way forward for a fascist regime, a war of aggression in Ethiopia. I will examine in more detail below the downward spiral of radicalizing adventure that followed, the, quote, cultural revolution, unquote, of 1936 through 38, European War in 1940, and the Puppet Republic of Salo under Nazi occupation in 1943-45. through 45. What drives radicalization? This brief review of Mussolini's vacillation between normalization and radicalization suggests that the leader alone drives things along, a position that came to be known and debated in the 1980s as intentionalism. Obviously, however, the leader's intentions mean little unless police officers, army commanders, magistrates, and civil servants are willing to obey his orders. Contemplating the notoriously indolent Hitler, some scholars were led to propose that the impulses to radicalization must have erupted from below in the initiatives taken by underlings frustrated by local emergencies and confident that the Fuhrer would cover their excesses as he had done with the Potempa murderers. This position was known in the debates of the 1980s as structuralism. We do not need to accept the absurdity of pure structuralism to recognize that, in addition to the leader's actions or words, fascist regimes embrace radicalizing impulses from below that distinguish them sharply from traditional authoritarian dictatorships. I have already alluded to the deliberate arousal of expectations of dynamism, excitement, momentum, and risk that were inherent to fascism's appeal, and which it was dangerous to abandon completely for fear of undermining the leader's principal source of power independent of the old elites. The party and its militants were themselves a powerful force for continued radicalization. No regime was authentically fascist without a popular movement that helped it achieve power, monopolized political activity, and played a major role in public life after power with its parallel organizations. We know already what serious problems the party could pose for the leader. Its battle-scarred militants thirsted after immediate rewards, jobs, power, money in ways that troubled the leader's necessary cooperation with the establishment. Old party comrades could easily turn into rivals for the supreme role if the leader falters. No fascist leader, not even Hitler, failed to have problems with his party. As we saw in the previous chapter, he needed to keep it in line, but he could hardly dispense with it, for it was his chief weapon 
in his permanent rivalry with the old elites. Hitler solved his conflicts with the Nazi party with characteristic speed and brutality, but it must not be imagined that even he did so without strain, or that he was always entirely in perfect control. Mussolini, too, was not unwilling to shed blood, as the murders of the Rosselli brothers and Mattiotti witnessed. But he dared execute his unruly party lieutenants only under the German boot in 1944. Sometimes he gave in to them, for example when he abandoned his proposed pact of pacification with the socialists after four months of raucous party debate in November 1921 and when he assumed dictatorial power in January 1925. Often he tried to channel them, as when he named Farinacci party secretary in 1925, or when he diverted the energies of another powerful Raz, Italo Balbo, into the Air Force and the African Empire. Not unlike Mussolini in his early laissez-faire period with Alberto de Stefani, Hitler named as his first minister of finance the conservative Lutz Graf Schweren von Krosik. For a time, the Führer left foreign policy in the hands of professional diplomats, with the aristocratic Konstantin von Neurath as the foreign minister, and the army in the hands of professional soldiers. But Hitler's drive to shrink the normative state and expand the prerogative state was much more sustained than Mussolini's. Total master of his party, Hitler exploited its radical impulses for his own aggrandizement against the old elites, and rarely, after the exemplary bloodbath of June 1934, needed to rein it in. Another suggested key to radicalization is the chaotic nature of fascist rule. Contrary to wartime propaganda and to an enduring popular image, Nazi Germany was not a purring, well-oiled machine. Hitler allowed party agencies to compete with more traditional state offices, and he named loyal lieutenants to overlapping jobs that pitted them against each other. The ensuing feudal struggles for supremacy within and between party and state shocked those Germans proud of their country's traditional, superbly trained and independent civil service. Fritz Dietloff, Count von der Schulenberg, a young Prussian official initially attracted to Nazism, lamented in 1937 that, quote, the formerly unified state power has been split into a number of separate authorities. Party and professional organizations work in the same areas and overlap with no clear divisions of responsibility, unquote. He feared, quote, the end of a true civil service and the emergence of a subservient bureaucracy, unquote. We saw in the previous chapter how the self-indulgently bohemian Hitler spent as little time as possible on the labors of government, at least until the war. He proclaimed his visions and hatreds in speeches and ceremonies and allowed his ambitious underlings to search for the most radical way to fulfill them in a Darwinian competition for attention and reward. His lieutenants, fully aware of his fanatical views, quote, worked toward the Fuhrer, unquote, who needed mainly to arbitrate among them. Mussolini, quite unlike Hitler in his commitment to the drudgery of government, refused to delegate and remained suspicious of competent associates, a governing style that produced more inertia than radicalization. War provided fascism's clearest radicalizing impulse. It would be more accurate to say that war played a circular role in fascist regimes. Early fascist movements were rooted in an exaltation of violence sharpened by World War I, and war-making proved essential to the cohesion, discipline, and explosive energy of fascist regimes. Once undertaken, war generated both the need for more extreme measures and popular acceptance of them. It seems a general rule that war is indispensable for the maintenance of fascist muscle tone and, in the cases we know, the occasion for its demise. It seems clear that both Hitler and Mussolini deliberately chose war as a necessary step in realizing the full potential of their regimes. 
They wanted to use war to harden internal society, as well as to conquer vital space. Hitler told Goebbels, quote, the war made possible for us the solution of a whole series of problems that could never have been solved in normal times, unquote. Hitler deliberately sought confrontation. Did he want war? A.J.P. Taylor argued in 1962 that Hitler stumbled into a war he did not want in September 1939, and that it was British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain who made the fatal decision for war by extending a military guarantee to Poland in March 1939. Taylor's revisionism was useful, for it forced a closer look at the archives. The most convincing conclusion, however, is that while Hitler may indeed not have wanted the long war of attrition on two fronts that he eventually got, he probably did want a local, short, victorious war in Poland, or at least the public impression of having got his way by a show of force. Every fiber of the Nazi regime had been bent to the business of preparing Germany materially and psychologically for war and not to use that force, sooner or later, would produce a potentially fatal loss of credibility. Mussolini was no less clearly drawn to war. Quote, When Spain is finished, I will think of something else, unquote, he told his son-in-law and foreign minister Galeazzo Ciano. Quote, the character of the Italian people must be molded by a fighting, unquote. He acclaimed war, as the sole source of human advance. Quote, War is to men as maternity is to women. Unquote. Less than a year after becoming prime minister in August 1923, Mussolini made his foreign policy debut with the Corfu incident, a spectacular piece of fascist bravado. After an Italian general and other members of an Italian commission trying to settle a border dispute between Albania and Greece were murdered, apparently by Greek bandits, Mussolini sent the Greek government a list of exorbitant demands. When the Greek authorities hesitated, Italian forces bombarded and occupied the island of Corfu. The Duce began preparations to invade Ethiopia in 1933 through 34. That fateful decision it aligned him irrevocably with Hitler against Britain and France, grew as much out of a need to revive fascist dynamism as out of traditional nationalist imperial dreams and vengeance for Italy's defeat by Ethiopia at Adwa in 1896. In the early 1930s, the Italian fascist regime faced a crisis of identity. It had been in power for a decade, the black shirts were growing complacent, and party ranks had been opened up to all comers. Many young people were coming of age unaware of fascism's heroic early days, perceiving fascists only as comfortable careerists. Later, when European war approached, although Mussolini, unlike Hitler, clearly wanted a negotiated settlement of the Czech crisis in 1938 and the Polish crisis in August 1939, he could not afford to stand aside forever. When Germany appeared to be on the point of definitive victory, he rushed into war against France. On June 10, 1940, despite the poor state of his armed forces. Possibly sharing some of his radical lieutenant's conviction that war would restore fascism's original spirit, he may also have thought it would strengthen his control. Above all, he had preached the martial virtues too long to stand aside without ridicule from an apparently easy victory. Mussolini's attacks on Albania and Greece in the fall of 1940 similarly were necessary for reasons of prestige and to maintain the fiction that he was waging his own war parallel to Hitler's. No vital economic or strategic stakes were involved in any of these campaigns. Even non-radicalized authoritarian regimes glorified the military. For all his desire to stay out of the war, Franco seized the opportunity offered by the defeat of France in 1940 to occupy Tangiers, as we saw earlier. Military parades were a major form of public ritual for Franquist Spain. Defeated France under the Vichy regime of World War I hero Marshal Pétain put much energy into military pomp and patriotic display. 
It never stopped asking the Nazi occupation authorities to allow the tiny Vichy Armistice Army to play a greater role in the defense of French soil from an Allied invasion. Even the quietest Portuguese dictator Salazar could not neglect the African empire that provided major emotional and economic support for his authoritarian state. But there is a difference between authoritarian dictatorships' glorification of the military and the emotional commitment of fascist regimes to war. Authoritarians used military pomp, but little actual fighting to help prop up regimes dedicated to preserving the status quo. Fascist regimes could not survive without the active acquisition of new territory for their race, Lebensraum, Spazio Vitali, and they deliberately chose aggressive war to achieve it clearly intending to wind the spring of their people to still higher tension. Fascist radicalization was not simply war government, moreover. Making war radicalizes all regimes, fascist or not, of course. All states demand more of their citizens in wartime, and citizens become more willing, if they believe the war is a legitimate one, to make exceptional sacrifices for the community and even to set aside some of their liberties. Increased state authority seems legitimate when the enemy is at the gate. During World War II, citizens of the democracies accepted not only material sacrifices, like rationing and the draft, but also major limitations on freedom, such as censorship. In the United States, during the Cold War, an insistent current of opinion wanted to limit liberties again, in the interest of defeating the communist enemy. War government under fascism is not the same as the democracy's willing and temporary suspension of liberties, however. In fascist regimes at war, a fanatical minority within the party or movement may find itself freed to express a furor far beyond any rational calculation of interest. In this way, we return to Hannah Arendt's idea that fascist regimes build on the fragmentation of their societies and the atomization of their populations. Arendt has been sharply criticized for making atomization one of the prerequisites for Nazi success, but her Origins of Totalitarianism, though cast in historical terms, is more a philosophical meditation on fascism's ultimate radicalization, than a history of origins. Even if the fragmentation and atomization of society work poorly as explanations for fascism's taking root and arriving in power, the fragmentation and atomization of government were characteristic of the last phase of fascism, the radicalization process. In the newly conquered territories, ordinary civil servants, Agents of the normative state were replaced by party radicals, agents of the prerogative state. The orderly procedures of bureaucracy gave way to the wild, unstructured improvisations of inexperienced party militants thrust into ill-defined positions of authority over conquered peoples. Trying to Account for the Holocaust the outermost reach of fascist radicalization was the Nazi murder of the Jews. No mere prose can do justice to the Holocaust, but the most convincing accounts have two qualities. For one, they take into account not only Hitler's obsessive hatred of Jews, but also the thousands of subordinates whose participation in the increasingly harsh actions against them that made the mechanism function. Without them, Hitler's murderous fantasy would have remained only a fantasy. The other quality is the recognition that the Holocaust developed step by step, from lesser acts to more heinous ones. Most scholars accept today that the Nazi assault upon the Jews developed incrementally, 
It grew neither entirely out of the disorderly local violence of a popular pogrom, nor entirely from the imposition from above of a murderous state policy. Both impulses ratcheted each other up in an ascending spiral, in a way appropriate to a dual state. Local eruptions of vigilantism by party militants were encouraged by the language of Nazi leaders and the climate of toleration for violence they established. The Nazi state, in turn, kept channeling the undisciplined initiatives of party militants into official policies applied in an orderly fashion. The first phase was segregation, marking the internal enemies, setting them apart from the nation, and suppressing their rights as citizens. This began in spring 1933 as street actions by party militants, the so-called revolution from below that followed immediately upon Hitler's assumption of office. The new regime tried to channel and control these chaotic incidents of marking and smashing Jewish shops with an official one-day boycott on April 1, 1933. The Nuremberg Laws of September 15, 1935, prohibiting intermarriage and annulling Jewish citizenship, elevated segregation into state policy. A pause followed, partly motivated by the regime's desire to present a positive face during the Berlin Olympics of 1936. When street violence erupted again in November 1938 in the synagogue, burnings, and shop smashings of Kristallnacht, fanned by Goebbels, other Nazi authorities sought to channel this grassroots action into a more orderly state policy of Aryanizing Jewish businesses. Quote, I have had enough of these demonstrations, unquote, Goering complained two days after Kristallnacht. Quote, it is not the Jews a harm, but me. As the final authority for coordinating the German economy, the insurance company will pay for the damage which does not even touch the Jew. And furthermore, the goods destroyed come from the consumer goods belonging to the people. We have not come together simply for more talk, but to make decisions to eliminate the Jew from the German economy." Segregation reached its climax with the marking of the Jewish population, first in occupied Poland in late 1939, and then in the Reich in August 1941. All Jews had to wear a yellow star of David sewn to the chest of their external garments. By this time, the next phase, expulsion, had already begun. The policy of expulsion germinated in the mixture of challenge and opportunity presented by the annexation of Austria in March 1938. This increased the number of Jews in the Reich and, at the same time, gave the Nazis more freedom to deal harshly with them. The SS officer Adolf Eichmann worked out in Vienna the system whereby wealthy Jews, terrorized by Nazi thugs, would pay well for exit permits, generating funds that could be applied to the expulsion of the others. German conquest of the western half of Poland in September 1939 brought further millions of Jews and an even freer hand in dealing with them. The murder of large numbers of the Polish and Jewish male elite by special military units, the Einsatzgruppen, was an integral part of the Polish campaign, but for the Jewish population in general, expulsion remained the ultimate aim. Trouble arose, however, when individual Nazi satraps tried to expel their Jews into territory governed by another. Many Nazi officials thought of the Nazi-occupied area of former Poland as an ideal dumping ground for Jews, but its governor, Hans Frank, wanted to make his territory a model colony by expelling Polish Jews eastward. It was Frank who won the race to Hitler's ear and stopped the expulsion of German Jews into Poland. The situation was further complicated by Himmler's project to resettle some 500,000 ethnic Germans from Eastern Europe and Northern Italy on lands vacated by expelled Jews and Poles. This 
domino game of interlocking population movements soon produced a traffic jam that some Nazi racial planners thought of relieving in spring and summer 1940 by sending European Jews to the French colony of Madagascar. The Nazis hoped that invading the Soviet Union in June 1941 would make expulsion easier again. Although the anticipated rapid conquest of Soviet territory would bring millions more Jews into Nazi hands, it would also open up the vast Russian hinterland into which to expel them. These hopes maintained expulsion as the official Nazi solution to the, quote, Jewish problem, unquote, until late 1941. Close studies of Nazi-occupied territories in Poland and the Soviet Union between September 1939 and late 1941, however, show surprising amounts of individual leeway and local variation among Nazi administrators in their treatment of Jews. Left to cope on their own with unexpectedly severe problems of security, supply, land tenure, and disease, they experimented with all sorts of local initiatives. Ghettoization, forced labor, resettlements. In the newly occupied Baltic states and eastern Poland, some Nazi administrators crossed the line from killing Jewish men for security reasons to the mass murder of whole Jewish populations, including women and children, as early as August to September 1941, apparently on local initiative, confident, of course, of Berlin's approval. Seen from this perspective, the famous meeting of high-level Nazi leaders under the chairmanship of Himmler's deputy Reinhard Heydrich on January 20, 1942, the Wannsee Conference, looks more like further state coordination of local extermination initiatives than the initiation of a new policy from above. Exactly when and why the old policy of expulsion, punctuated by the murder of many Jewish men for, quote, security, unquote, reasons, gave way in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe to a new policy of total extermination of all Jews, including women and children, remains one of the most hotly debated issues in interpreting the Holocaust. It is not even certain whether we should focus on Hitler, or on his underlings in the field. If we focus on Hitler, the absence of any trace of an explicit Fuhrer order for the final stage of annihilation has caused trouble to the intentionalists, probably unnecessarily. No serious scholar doubts Hitler's central responsibility. The Fuhrer's unswerving hatred of Jews was known to all, and he was briefed regularly on what was going on. The local administrators knew he would cover their most extreme actions. It is likely that he issued some kind of verbal order in fall 1941 in response to the ongoing campaign against Soviet Russia, either in the euphoria of the first advance, or, more likely, in rage as he failed to take Moscow before winter and achieve the Blitzkrieg victory upon which the whole operation depended. A recent plausible theory locates Hitler's order in a secret speech to high party officials on December 12, 1941, in reaction to the entry of the United States into the war and its transformation into a truly worldwide conflict. Hitler would thus be fulfilling the threat he made in a speech on January 30, 1939, that if the war became worldwide, the Jews were to blame and would pay. Hitler believed Jews controlled American policy. If we shift our focus to the administrators in the field, we have seen how some of them had already crossed the line in late summer 1941 between the selective killing of adult males and the total extermination of the whole Jewish population. This would not have been possible without widespread, murderous Jew hatred, one point on which Daniel Goldhagen's celebrated and controversial Hitler's willing executioners is right. But the existence of widespread murderous Jew hatred does not tell us why the line was crossed in certain places at certain times and not others. The most convincing studies present a dynamic process of, quote, cumulative radicalization, unquote 
in which problems magnify, pressures build, inhibitions fall away, and legitimating arguments are found. Two kinds of development help explain how a readiness built up to kill all Jews, including women and children. One is a series of, quote, dress rehearsals, unquote, that served to lower inhibitions and provided trained personnel hardened for anything. First came the euthanasia of incurably ill and insane Germans, begun on the day when World War II began. Nazi eugenics theory had long provided a racial justification for getting rid of inferior persons. War provided a broader justification for reducing the drain of, quote, useless mouths, unquote, on scarce resources. The T4 program killed more than 70,000 people between September 1939 and 1941, when, in response to protests from the victims' families and Catholic clergy, the matter was left to local authorities. Some of the experts trained in this program were subsequently transferred to the occupied East, where they applied their mass-killing techniques to Jews. This time, there was less opposition. The second, quote, dress rehearsal, unquote, was the work of the Einsatzgruppen, the intervention squads specially charged with executing the political and cultural elite of invaded countries. In the Polish campaign of September 1939, they helped wipe out the Polish intelligentsia and high civil service, evoking some opposition within the military command. In the Soviet campaign, the Einsatzgruppen received the notorious, quote, Commissar Order, unquote, to kill all Communist Party cadres as well as the Jewish leadership, seen as identical in the Nazi eyes, along with the gypsies. This time, the army raised no objections. The Einsatzgruppen subsequently played a major role though they were far from alone, in the mass killings of Jewish women and children that began in some occupied areas in fall 1941. The third, quote, dress rehearsal, unquote, was the intentional death of millions of Soviet prisoners of war. It was on 600 of them that the Nazi occupation authorities first tested the mass-killing potential of the commercial insecticide Zyklon B at Auschwitz on September 3, 1941. Most Soviet prisoners of war, however, were simply worked or starved to death. The second category of developments that helped prepare a, quote, willingness to murder, unquote, consisted of blockages, emergencies, and crises that made the Jews become a seemingly unbearable burden to the administrators of conquered territories. A major blockage was the failure to capture Moscow that choked off the anticipated expulsion of all the Jews of conquered Eastern Europe far into the Soviet interior. A major emergency was shortages of food supplies for the German invasion force. German military planners had chosen to feed the invasion force with the resources of the invaded areas, in full knowledge that this meant starvation for local populations. When local supplies fell below expectations, the search for, quote, useless mouths, unquote, began. In the twisted mentality of the Nazi administrators, Jews and gypsies also posed a security threat to German forces. Another emergency was created by the arrival of trainloads of ethnic Germans awaiting resettlement, for whom space had to be made available. Faced with these accumulating problems, Nazi administrators developed a series of, quote, intermediary solutions, unquote. One was ghettos, but these proved to be incubators for disease, an obsession with the cleanly Nazis, and a drain on the budget. The attempt to make the ghettos work for German war production yielded little except another category of useless mouths, those incapable of work. Another, quote, intermediary solution, unquote, was the stillborn plan, already mentioned, to settle European Jews en masse in some remote area such as Madagascar, East Africa, or the Russian hinterland. The failure of all the intermediary solutions 
helped open the way for a, quote, final solution, unquote, extermination. The first mass executions were accomplished by gunfire, a process that was slow, messy, and psychologically stressful for the killers, though many became inured to it. The search for more efficient killing techniques led to the development of specially prepared vans, Gaswagen, into which exhaust fumes were piped, an idea derived from the trailers in which the mentally ill had been gassed by carbon monoxide in Poland in 1940. In fall 1941, 30 such vans were constructed for the wholesale liquidation of Jewish populations in occupied Russia. Even faster technology was adopted in spring 1942, when fixed killing installations were constructed at six camps on former Polish territory. Most of these continued to use carbon monoxide, but some, notably Auschwitz, used the quicker and more easily handled Zyklon B. The death factories eventually accounted for 60% of the Jews murdered by the Nazis during World War II. The new centers for industrialized mass killing were constructed outside the reach of the German normative state and of German law. Two, Auschwitz and Chelno, were in territory annexed from Poland in 1939, and the other four, Treblinka, Sobibor, Majdanek, and Belcek, were located in the former Polish lands known as the General Government. There, military authorities shared power with civilian officials largely composed of party militants. In captured areas of Poland and the Soviet Union, parallel organizations like the party's agency that seized land for redistribution to German peasants, the Rasse und Siedlungsschaftan, had more freedom than in the Reich. The SS set up its own military economic empire, there where the normative state played hardly any role at all. In that no man's land, both bureaucratic regularity and moral principles were easily set aside, and the needs of the master race became the only criteria for action. The traditional contempt of German nationalists for Slavic Untermenschen aggravated the permissive climate. In that nameless non-state, Nazi zealots had free reign to fulfill their wildest fantasies of racial purification without interference from a distant normative state. The fragmented Nazi administrative system left the radicals unaccountable and able to enact their darkest impulses. The Fuhrer, standing above and outside the state, was ready to reward initiative in the jungle of Nazi administration of the eastern-occupied territories. We can dismiss any notion that the Nazi regime murdered Jews in order to gratify German public opinion. It took elaborate precautions to hide these actions from the German people and from foreign observers. In official documents, the responsible authorities referred to the killings with euphemisms, like Sonderbehandlung, special handling, and undertook major operations to eliminate all traces of them at a time when men and material could hardly be spared from the fighting. At the same time, there was no particular effort to keep this secret from German troops on the Eastern Front, many of whom were regularly assigned to participate. Some soldiers and officials photographed the mass executions and sent pictures home to their families and girlfriends. Many thousands of soldiers, civil administrators, and technicians stationed in the Eastern Occupied Territories were eyewitnesses to mass killings. Many more thousands heard about them from participants. The knowledge inside Germany that dreadful things were being done to Jews in the East was, quote, fairly widespread, unquote. As long as disorderly destruction such as the shopfront smashings, beatings, and murders of Kristallnacht did not take place under their windows, most of them let distance, indifference, fear of denunciation, and their own sufferings under Allied bombing stifle any objections. In the end, 
radicalized Nazism lost even its nationalist moorings. As he prepared to commit suicide in his Berlin bunker in April 1945, Hitler wanted to pull the German nation down with him, in a final frenzy. This was partly a sign of his character. A compromise peace was as unthinkable for Hitler as it was for the Allies, but it also had a basis within the nature of the regime. Not to push forward was to perish. Anything was better than softness. Italian Radicalization, Internal Order, Ethiopia, Salo. Nazi Germany, in its final paroxysm, is the only authentic example so far of the ultimate stage of fascist radicalization. Italian fascism, too, displayed some signs of the forces that drive all fascisms toward the extreme. We saw earlier in this chapter how Mussolini was torn between the radical wishes of the Raz and the Squadristi and his own preference for order and state predominance over the party. But he could not escape from his self-promoted image as activist hero, and his language remained colored with revolutionary imagery. He could not ignore entirely his followers' need for fulfillment and the public's expectation of dramatic achievements that he had himself encouraged. In the 1930s, perhaps with the already mentioned aim of rejuvenating his paunchy black shirts, perhaps also under pressure to divert his people's attention from Italy's mediocre economic performance during the Depression, Mussolini embarked on a farther-reaching period of radicalization. After 1930, he had already adopted a more aggressive tone in foreign policy, calling for rearmament and predicting that, quote, the 20th century will be the century of fascism, unquote. He took back into his own hands in 1932 the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and in 1933 the Ministries of War, the Navy, and Air. By 1934, he was secretly preparing a military operation in Ethiopia, taking as a pretext a minor skirmish in December 1934 at Walwal, a remote desert waterhole near the unmarked frontier between Ethiopia and Italian Somaliland, now Eritrea, Mussolini launched his armies against Ethiopia on October 3, 1935. After a one-sided campaign that required more Italian effort than foreseen, Mussolini was able to proclaim victory and declare King Victor Emmanuel III Emperor of Ethiopia on May 9, 1936. From the balcony of his offices in the Palazzo Venezia in Rome, Mussolini engaged in a triumphal dialogue with the excited crowd. Quote, Officers, non-commissioned officers, soldiers of all the armed forces of the state in Africa and Italy, black shirts of the revolution, Italian men and women in the fatherland and throughout the world, listen. Our gleaming sword has cut all the knots, and the African victory will remain in the history of the fatherland, complete and pure, a victory such as the legionnaires who have fallen and those who have survived dreamed of and willed. The Italian people has created the empire with its blood. It will fertilize it with its labor and defend it with its arms against anybody whomsoever. Will you be worthy of it? Crowd. Yes. The Ethiopian War gave the fascist party a, quote, new impulse, unquote. At home, it was the occasion for a masterly bit of nationalist theater, the collection of gold wedding rings from the women of Italy, from Queen Elena on down, to help pay for the campaign. Officially, it was the fascist militia, MVSN, that went to fight in Ethiopia. The party presence was strong in the conquered territory. The party federale shared power with the prefect and the army commander and attempted to regiment both the settler population and young Ethiopians through fascist youth and leisure organizations. Colonial rule even permitted a revival of squadrismo, long shut down at home. In 1937, 
after an assassination attempt on General Graziani, Governor General and Viceroy, party activists terrorized the inhabitants of Addis Ababa for three days and killed hundreds of them. The excitement and effort of war were accomplished by a, quote, cultural revolution, unquote, and a, quote, totalitarian leap, unquote, svolta totalitaria at home. Another activist party secretary, Achille Staracci, 1931-39, through 39, led a campaign to shape the fascist new man by instituting fascist customs, fascist language, and racial legislation. The reform of custom replaced the deferential and formal way of saying you in the third person, lay, used by proper bourgeois, by the more familiar and comradely second person, two in the singular, voix in the plural. The fascist salute replaced the bourgeois handshake, civil servants were dressed in uniform, and the army began to march with the exaggerated high step that the regime called Passo Romano to make it clear that it was not copied from the Nazi goose step. The most striking step in the fascist radicalization of the 1930s was discriminatory legislation against Jews. In July 1938, a, quote, manifesto of fascist racism, unquote, announced the new policy, and it was soon followed up by laws in September and November that forbade racial intermarriage along the lines in the Nazi Nuremberg laws and excluded Jews from government service and the professions. One out of 12 university professors had to abandon their chairs. The Nobel Prize-winning physicist Enrico Fermi, not Jewish himself, left voluntarily for the United States because he was deprived of many of his research associates. The fascists are usually assumed to have copied Nazi racial laws to please Hitler during the period of Italian foreign policy alignment with the Axis. Italy had been largely devoid of anti-Semitism, and its small and ancient Jewish community had been exceptionally well integrated. As we saw in Chapter 1, Mussolini had had Jewish backers and even close associates in the early days. In 1933, he was listed by American Jewish publishers among the world's, quote, 12 greatest Christian champions, unquote, of the Jews. On closer inspection, one can find Italian stems upon which a native anti-Semitism could be grafted. Policies of racial discrimination had already become acceptable to Italians in the colonies. First in Libya and then in Ethiopia, the Italian military adopted tactics of separating nomads from their animals and from food and water. Their mass internment seemed to prefigure their elimination. In Ethiopia, laws forbade racial mixing, though they were widely flaunted. Angelo del Boca can even use the word apartheid for what fascism tried to institute in Ethiopia. Another stem was the ambiguity of Catholic attitudes about Jews. To its credit, Catholic tradition was hostile to biological racism. The Church insisted, for example, that the sacrament of baptism prevented a convert from being henceforth considered Jewish, regardless of who his or her parents had been. Pope Pius XI had been trying to decide whether to issue an encyclical denouncing Nazi biological racism when he died in 1939. On the other hand, the language of the Mass for Good Friday identified the Jews as the, quote, deicide people, unquote, who had killed Christ. Church publications continued for a shockingly long time to express the coarsest forms of anti-Semitism, including accrediting the ancient legend of Jewish ritual murder. The Church raised no objection to non-biological forms of discrimination against Jews in Catholic countries, such as quotas in universities and limitations on economic activity. As for secular fascists, there had always been anti-Semites among them. Some of them, like Telesio Interlandi, were given prominent space in the party press from the middle 1930s on, even before the formation of the Axis. 
It is true that the new legislation was generally unpopular, and that in Italian-occupied Croatia and southeastern France, Italian authorities actually protected Jews. When the Germans began deporting Jews from Italy in 1943, few Italians joined in that undertaking. There had been enough support for the 1938 legislation, however, for it to be applied quite firmly. After 1938, Mussolini's regime subsided once more into business as usual. When war began in September 1939, he told Hitler he was not ready. When he finally entered World War II, at the last possible moment, it brought Mussolini neither the spoils of victory nor the heightened popular enthusiasm he had hoped for. Mussolini's parallel war after June 1940 intended to assert equality with Hitler, led only to defeats and humiliations that ended fascism's, quote, privileged relation with history, unquote, and snapped the last links of affection between the Italian people and the Duce. The Germans, too, received with gloom the news that World War II had begun. Hitler's successes, however, charged them with zeal. They made war longer and with more determination in 1939 through 45, despite greater civilian suffering than in 1914 through 18. In Italy, by contrast, the balloon of fascist excitement burst quickly. In retrospect, fascist mobilization turned out to be more fragile than democratic mobilization. Churchill could move the British people by an honest promise of nothing but blood, sweat, toil, and tears. Mussolini's final days offer another case of radicalization, though it was geographically limited to northern Italy. When it became clear that Italy's participation in World War II on Hitler's side was turning into a disaster, Parts of the establishment, senior military officers, advisors to the king, even some dissident fascists, wanted to get rid of Mussolini and make a separate peace with the Allies. Soon after the Allies landed in Sicily on July 10, 1943, in the pre-dawn hours of July 25th, the fascist Grand Council voted a resolution to restore full authority to the king. The same afternoon, Victor Emmanuel dismissed the deflated Duce from office and had him arrested. That ignominious arrest should have put an end to Mussolini's charisma. On September 12th, however, a daring German commando raid led by SS Captain Otto Scorzani liberated him from his captivity atop the Gran Sasso ski resort east of Rome. Hitler reinstated the Duce as the dictator of a fascist republic whose capital was at Salo, on Lake Garda, handy to the main road to Germany via the Brenner Pass. The Italian Social Republic was never more than a German puppet and deserves little more than a footnote in history. It interests us here, however, for freed from the need to mollify the church, the king, and the financial and industrial leadership of Italy, the Salo Republic reverted to the radical impulses of fascism's first days. At Salo, Mussolini surrounded himself with some remaining party fanatics and a few pro-Nazi officers. They played the one card left to them, a populist national socialism. The new fascist Republican Party program of November 1943 called for the socialization of those sectors of the economy necessary for self-sufficiency, energy, raw materials, indispensable services, and leaving in private hands only property that was the fruit of personal effort and savings. The public sector was to be run by management committees in which the workers could have a voice. Unproductive or uncultivated farms would be taken over by their hired hands. Roman Catholicism remained the religion of the fascist republic, but many of the new leaders were irreligious. The new republic promised to govern through an assembly, which would be chosen by unions, professional groups, and soldiers. The Italian Social Republic at Salo never had the power to put these measures into effect, however. Its radicalization's main effect was to make its police and armed squads murderous in the Italian Civil War of 1944 through 45. 
The Salo Republic also tried to remedy the slackness that had overcome established fascism in Italy. It raised new armed forces of committed fascists to carry on the war against the Allies. These consisted mainly of volunteer groups, like Prince Borghese's 10th Torpedo Boat Squadron, which fought on dry land and mostly against the resistance. The agents of the Salo Republic also tried to remedy most Italians' refusal to take anti-Semitism seriously. It was at this point that fascist activists rounded up Jews and put them in camps where the Nazis had easy access to them. This is how the chemist and later celebrated author Primo Levi was taken prisoner in December 1943 to end up in Auschwitz. The Salo Republic sought revenge against the traitors to Mussolini within fascism. The Republic had its hands on only a few members of the fascist Grand Council who had voted against Mussolini on July 25th, but it executed five of them, including Mussolini's own son-in-law, Count Ciano, the fascist regime's former foreign minister, at Verona in January 1944. Even so, all the blood shed by the Republic of Salo was only a few drops compared to that spilled by Nazism's final days. As the Allied armies approached in April 1945, Mussolini's few remaining supporters melted away. Italian partisans found him on April 28th, hidden in the back of a German army truck withdrawing up the western shore of Lake Como, and killed him along with his steadfast young mistress, Clara Petacci, and several fascist notables. They strung up the bodies in a Milan filling station, after a bitter crowd had mutilated the Duce's corpse. Only a generation later would Mussolini's remains, restored to the family in 1957 and buried in his home village of Predapio, become an object of pilgrimage. Final Thoughts The radicalization stage shows us fascism at its most distinctive. While any regime can radicalize, the depth and force of the fascist impulse to unleash destructive violence, even to the point of self-destruction, sets it apart. At this ultimate stage, comparison is hardly possible. Only one fascist regime really reached it. A tempting candidate for comparison has been Stalin's radicalization of the Soviet dictatorship. The Nazi and Soviet cases shared a rejection of the state of law and due process, both subordinated them to the imperatives of history. In other respects, however, fascist radicalization was not identical to the Stalinist form. Fascism idealized violence in a distinctive way, as a virtue proper to a master race. And while the agents of Stalin's purges knew that they would be covered by the dictator, the Soviet system lacked Nazism's ingrained competition between parallel party organizations and established elites for their leaders' favor. Expansionist war lies at the heart of radicalization. Insofar as fascist Italy radicalized, it did so most fully in conquered East Africa and in the final paroxysm of the Italian campaign. The Nazi regime reached the outer limits of radicalization with its war of extermination against the Soviet Union. In that specially charged situation, Nazi officials felt free to take more violent action than they had done in the Western campaigns of 1940. First, against the enemies of the regime, then against fascism's conservative allies, and eventually against the German people themselves in an ecstasy of terminal destruction. Whereas in traditional authoritarian war regimes, the army tends to extend its control, as it did in the German Reich during 1917-18 through 18, and in Franco's Spain, the German army lost control of occupation policy in the East after 1941, as we have seen, to the Nazi Party's parallel organizations. Party radicals felt free to express their hatreds and obsessions in ways that were foreign to the traditions of the state services, 
The issue here is not simply one of moral sensitivity. Some officers and civil servants were appalled by SS actions in the conquered territories, while others went along because of group solidarity or because they had become hardened. It was, to some degree, an issue of turf. It would be unthinkable for a traditional military dictatorship to tolerate the incursions of amateurish party militias into military spheres that Hitler, and even in Ethiopia Mussolini, permitted. Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, so problematical for the earlier stages of fascism, fits here. For here, we enter a realm where the calculations of interest that arguably governed the behavior of both the Nazis and their allies under more ordinary circumstances in the exercise of power no longer determined policy. At this ultimate stage, an obsessed minority is able to carry out its most passionate hatreds implacably and to the ultimate limit of human experience. Liberation from constraints permitted a hard core of the movement's fanatics to regain the upper hand over their bourgeois allies and carry out some of the initial radical projects. At the outposts of the empire, fascism recovered the face-to-face -face violence of the early days of squadrismo and S.A. street brawling. One must resist the temptation at this final stage to revert to a highly personalized way of looking at the exercise of power in fascist regimes, with its discredited notions of hoodlums kidnapping the state. The Nazi regime was able to pursue the war with ever-mounting intensity only with the continued complicity of the state services and large sectors of the socially powerful. Fascist radicalization, finally, cannot be understood as a rational way to persuade a people to give their all to a war effort. It led Nazi Germany into a runaway spiral that ultimately prevented rational war-making, as vital resources were diverted from military operations to the murder of the Jews. Finally, radicalization denies even the nation that is supposed to be at fascism's heart. At the end, fanatical fascists prefer to destroy everything in a final paroxysm, even their own country, rather than admit defeat. Prolonged fascist radicalization over a very long period has never been witnessed. It is even hard to imagine. Can one suppose that even Hitler could keep up the tension in old age? Arranging the succession to a senescent fascist leader is another intriguing but so far hypothetical problem. The more normal form of succession to a fascist regime is likely to be decay into a traditional authoritarianism. At that point, there can be progressive liberalization, as in post-Franco Spain, or perhaps revolution, as in post-Salazar Portugal. But orderly succession is clearly far more of a problem with fascism than with other forms of rule, even communism. Fascism is, in the last analysis, destabilizing. In the long run, therefore, it was not really a solution to the problems of frightened conservatives or liberals. The final outcome was that the Italian and German fascist regimes drove themselves off a cliff in their quest for ever headier successes. Mussolini had to take his fatal step into war in June 1940 because fascist absence from Hitler's victory over France might well fatally loosen his grip on his people. Hitler never stopped imagining further conquests. India, the Americas until he committed suicide in his besieged bunker in Berlin on April 30th, 1945. The fascisms we know seem doomed to destroy themselves in their headlong, obsessive rush to fulfill the privileged relation with history they promised their people. So ends Chapter 6 of Robert Paxton's The Anatomy of Fascism. Um, a chapter that really outlines some of the 
uh, more horrifying things about fascism, but also the the fact that what we typically associate with this is fascism. Um, I think this chapter does a great job of outlining why that is, in fact, merely the last gasp of a true fascist uh, dictatorship. Um, it is dangerous, in fact, to associate the popular image of fascism with the only um, iteration or, or, or the, the single iteration that fascism takes rather than simply its end point. Um, I think you see that a lot in people refusing to acknowledge the fascist um, leanings of contemporary politicians because they're not, you know, goose-stepping around and murdering people with Zyklon B gas. Well, that is not what fascism is. I'd like to take this time to thank my patrons on Patreon. Uh, if you, too, would like to support this channel, please visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash audioanarchy. Thank you to Moby Bongo, Jamie Suarez, Matthew Vergen, Jordan Peterson's pharmacist, Michael Rudge, Darth Malik 135, Luna Diltz, Chris Kilbasa, Bilet, Bo Whitney, Jacob Jubeck, and Bonnie. That's going to do it for me. Go ahead and get out there and seize the means of production, my little anarchist friends. <laughs>